So let me read those for you, and we'll pray and begin. We are live, by the way. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then verse 9, which we'll get to next week, starts, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Right? So, uh, let's, let's pray, and then we'll dig right into it. Father, I pray and I ask that there would be no pretension in my prayer right now, that there would be no arrogance or spiritual pride, anything that we think about. Or, um, Lord, I know the temptation tonight is going to be that we are to turn to other people that we know or someone in this room or someone that lives in our house. And we go, well, they're guilty of that when it comes to our prayers. But, Lord, prayers are such an individual and private thing. I ask that you impart that severity to these students tonight that we understand and we don't take for granted how how precious prayers are to you and fellowship with you through your word and through prayer i ask that you leave that we leave uh, this evening understanding and applying these things and that we change our view of prayer and realize some of the pitfalls that we have so that next week when we dig into your word we can see exactly line by line those precious words, those famous words of the Lord's Prayer, that we can begin to implement the right way to do it. Thank you for these students. Thank you for these adults in this room. Thank you that they made coming here and sitting under the Word of God a priority. Lord, I know and I hope they do that you will bless them eternally for that. Thank you for them. I love them and I know you love them infinitely more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, I basically have a transcript tonight. I'm just going to start at the top. Okay, been working for days on this. Today, ironically, is a day devoted and committed to prayer. Some of you this morning went to something called See You at the Poll. Where thousands of students gathered together and prayed earnestly for our schools and our nation. Some were there for a spectacle. Many were there for an experience and fewer still were there for the right reason of praying to the true and living God. It is a great concern, and I hope you hear me in the right tone, it's a great concern that we treat prayer so flippantly. And more concerning still that so many attend events like this and fields of faith as an event or spectacle to be entertained. This is the Roman Colosseum, oftentimes minus the human sacrifice. I saw a girl leaving me to see you at the pole this morning. She walked right past me. She was crying. Tears, they look like real tears. It could have been crocodile tears, I don't know. Crying, and immediately she raises her phone up and takes a selfie and sends it. And as I walked by, I thought, was that about the Lord or was that about her? I mean, that's a question I pondered. That's a question we all ought to ponder. Not about taking crying religious selfies, but more so about taking our prayers towards the Lord seriously tonight. I'm greatly concerned about the fact that most students and adults in general use prayer to seem religious while never really praying in a way that God is pleased with. Here in America, evangelical Christianity is the Wild West when it comes to prayer. Be careful that you don't bow your head but never bow your heart. Be careful that you don't bow your head and never bow your heart. We say words, but often those words are to ourselves. We try and pray to change God's mind. You've heard people pray like this. We try to pray to change God's mind or heart, not our own. Sometimes prayer is not an event, it's fellowship. And I'm concerned that many today pray to a God they don't know. Or they pray to a God they don't love. You can tell a lot by listening to the way someone prays. If they're being sincere, you can tell a lot. And we don't know their heart. I'm not saying it's necessarily a window to their heart. But we do know a lot just from listening to them. I'm concerned that many of us don't pray because we avoid God and we think he wants to avoid us too. 
Next week, like I said, we turn to the most powerful way to pray ever uttered. But tonight, let's look at how not to do it. I wrote ten myths about prayer. Ten. Number one, we believe that prayer is about us. It's not. It's not about you. Number two, we believe prayer is a spiritual, superstitious ritual we check a box for. We believe prayer is a superstitious ritual. Number three, we believe that prayer is primarily about requests. What can I get from God? We believe that prayer is about getting, not giving. We believe that we get to picture God however we want when we pray. Whatever you have in your mind's eye, you just... He's Ronald McDonald with a crown on top of his head. Whatever it may be. We believe that we need to find God through prayer. We have to push through the fog. Y'all ever felt like that where you're praying but your prayers don't even make it to the ceiling? That's how it feels? Some of you guys who have been serious about it know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a terrible feeling. But it is just that. It's a feeling. We believe that every prayer is valid from all people. That one might sting a little bit. We think that all prayers, no matter who they're praying to, as long as they're sincere, they're valid. That's not true. That's not true. We believe that prayer must be many words. Oh, and heck, I, I can be guilty of this. I pray on Sunday morning. Some of you guys are like, I just wish I had a tomato and I could throw it at him so he would shut up on Sunday mornings. And if that's the case... Let's fight in the parking lot afterwards. But seriously, seriously, if if we fall into this trap, it's because we believe if we repeat it over and over, we say it long enough and loud enough, God will hear us. Number 10, we believe that prayer replaces fellowship with God through his word. And there are many more, but those are 10. Let me ask you a question. I hope you're listening. When I say the word God, what is the first thing that you think of? Answer answer to yourself, you know. I wouldn't you don't have to answer out loud, but seriously, when I say the word association, when I say God, what pops in your mind first? It's very likely that whatever popped in your mind about God is the most important thing about you, according to A.W. Tozer. Or at least the most telling thing when it comes to how you pray. When you close your eyes and you pray, assuming that you actually do pray, who are you or what are you praying to? Is what you are praying to in line with God's character and nature? Or are you praying to a false god? It's a very real question. Do we even know God's character and nature? How would we even know if we're praying to him? What do you picture when you think about God? Is it even God that you're picturing? How do you know it's God you're praying to? You ever ask yourself that question? How do you know you're praying to God? You might be praying to yourself. For being honest. If I were to ask you when you get done praying, who did you just talk to? Could you write down and describe who it was? These are real questions. I hope you're listening to them. They're real questions. Really questions you should ask. If you don't know exactly who it is you're praying to, how do you find out? If someone calls me, spam calls me, or what we used to call Star 69. Someone prank calls me that back in the back in the day. Someone prank calls me and they say, uh, hello, is this Taylor? And I immediately, guys in the corner, I immediately go, who is this? That's the knee-jerk reaction. Who am I speaking to? And if he says, my name is Chris. No, probably not. Right? So if he says something, he, she says something that I can't verify, I have to trust them eventually. I have to just trust who they are. And that they're in somewhere in Idaho and not Singapore.
Do you think many of us think it's cathartic or therapeutic to talk out loud and that's what we call prayer? That's just thinking out loud. Thinking out loud is not prayer. Just want to clear the air on that. You talking to yourself is not coming before the king of the universe. Do you think that some people believe that they are manifesting what they believe by saying it out loud? New age. The answer is yes to all these questions. Guess you don't know. Is it possible that some people use prayer to brainstorm with themselves out loud solutions to problems that they don't yet have solved? Is that possible? It absolutely is possible. It absolutely does happen. Do you think that people ever pray because they think they need to as if they're checking a spiritual box? You think being specific with who you pray to is important, do you? What if you're praying to, the person you're praying to is not God, but some demonic source instead? Happens. I assume that you talk to your best friends and your close family members believing that they are known by you and that what you know of them is true. If what we say, now listen to these carefully, guys. If, what, if we say that God is our friend, what's it like being his friend? Can you tell me? I can tell you what it's like being Keaton's friend. I'm not her friend. She's my friend. She doesn't like me. But but trying to be friends with a porcupine, I know. She's laughing. She's not refuting. I know. They look like, that's you too, bro. I, I know that what it's like to be her friend. I know what it's like to call Dalen my friend. We have a relationship. We're friends. And I know what it's like to be friends with him. It's not the same as being friends with her, but I know what it's like. I can describe it to you. We call God our friend, but can you even tell me what friendship with him is like? I mean, I assume you talk to your friends, correct? How often do we talk to God? Does someone have to force us to in a setting like this? Because, I mean, I would think nobody would have to make you talk to him if he's your friend. How many of you guys have a relationship? And I, I, I probably better not ask that question. Probably better not ask that question. If we say that God is our Father, what's it like being His child? If we say God's our Father, what's it like being His son or daughter? It's the greatest thing in the whole universe. But can you tell me what that's like? Some of the, okay, uh, I'll go there. Some of, some of you guys have really awful heads. Biological fathers. And some of you guys have wonderful, godly men who are your fathers. And yeah, we know from psychology, we've been saying it forever, that your view of your father impacts greatly your view of God. Because we refer to him as father. But the truth is, we can't put on God all the failures and sins of our father. But I can tell you what it's like being Tony Wyndham's son, the good and the bad. I can tell you that. I've known him my whole life. Dalen, you could go on and on and on about T being Tim O'Neill's son. You could tell me all about it. I know you could. Here's the thing, though. Listen to me. Here's the thing. Can you actually describe to me what it's like to be an adopted child of God? This is what I love about you. I think you actually can answer that question better than most of us. Because you understand the beauty of adoption. And I, I say that to your credit, Avery, not to embarrass you at all. I think it's a glorious thing. If we say that God is our peace, when was the last time that he gave you any? Can you describe that? Do you know? If we say we believe in prayer, is it prayer we believe in or the God who hears our prayers? We say all the time in church, I believe in the power of prayer. What does that even mean? Is that just the power of positive confession? Is that the power of manifestation? What does that even mean? You don't go around saying, I believe in the power of... I believe in the power of Dodge Rams. I mean, like, what? And I, obviously, I believe in the power of pizza. Like, it fuels my body. Not well. But it does. I mean, how foolish is that, really? I believe in the power of prayer. You know Muslims pray at least five times a day, right? Way more than most of you. And they believe in the power of prayer, but their God doesn't answer because he's not real. 
Do we simply believe in prayer in some psychological way that is therapeutic for us to mutter out loud? How do we hear God speak back to us? Is it not the reading of his word? Matthew 6, 5 through 8, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Now, when you hear the word hypocrite coming out of Jesus' mouth, you should go, rah, rah, Reggie. This is about to get rough. Right? When you hear, what's up, Mom? When you hear that, when you hear that, you should probably go, oh, uh, this is serious. Right? Matthew 6, 5 through 8. Good to see you too, Mom. So, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now listen, on the heels of discussing what is hypocritical about giving in the first four verses for reasons that glorify men rather than God, Jesus immediately turns to, here's a hypocritical way that you go about another sacrament, prayer. Notice he starts on verse 5 with the word and, because the hypocritical nature of his warnings coming in the next few verses is directly connected to the type of people who are described in verses 1 through 4. They do the same thing. If you're hypocritical in your prayer, you're often hypocritical in your giving. If you're hypocritical in your giving, you're often hypocritical in your prayer. Okay? Hypocrites are people who do what is good so people think they are good while hating righteousness and still loving sin. Talk about this last night. Hypocrites are also people who believe that they desire and deserve the glory that belongs only to God. Have you ever stopped and thought about how you look when it comes to your prayers? Seriously. Think about you. Don't think about someone else. Think about you. Are you weeping? Are you broken? Are you excited? Are you filled with passion? Are your hands lifted? Is your head tilted down? Is your head tilted up? Are you standing or are you sitting? Are you praying out loud or praying internally? As with all hypocritical discussions and manners, the question that we should be asking is, why are we doing what we are doing? God does not primarily care about what it is that we are doing. It's the motivation behind what we're doing that he's concerned with. The same people who give hypocritically are the same ones who pray hypocritically. One of the defining characteristics of people who believe that they can impress God and other people by things they do is that they are constantly seeking to do them in front of people, no matter what they're doing. The truth is, this is a battle that rages in our hearts nonstop. We must be constantly putting people-pleasing desire and praise from men and women and self-exaltation and pride to death. In our hearts and lives. If we're not going to be serious about this. Jesus' response is very simple. Jesus said they have received their reward in full. Now meditating on that the past few days has been very terrifying. Because Jesus is saying the praise of men is all you'll ever get from God. If you're hypocritical like this. I hope the claps and the back slaps are good enough. Because that's all you're going to get. That's it. Think about this statement. Jesus is saying that people who demonstrate hypocritical praying, all they can expect to receive is the faint praise of sinful men. In other words, you better be happy with the praise of man because you'll never again receive praise from God. When we check our hearts for hypocrisy, we must be also willing to ask ourselves whose glory and whose praise are we doing these things like prayer for? Some of you may be asking secretly, what does this have to do with me? I never pray anyway, so I'm not hypocritical. Examine your motives as well. Do you fail to pray because it's not about you? Or because you feel as though it serves no real benefit to your life? There are many different ways to be hypocritical in our prayers. Now listen to me, because some of y'all have tuned me out because you think whatever brand you do is never hypocritical. So listen. There are many different ways to be hypocritical. You can stand up so people can see you. You can sit down so people think you're humble. Are you listening? You can lift your hands to look spiritual. 
And you can keep them down so people think you're full of poorness of spirit. You can pray out loud so people can hear you. And you can pray for yourself, to yourself, so people think you're super spiritual. You can pray on a stage so that everybody looks at you. Or you can make your posture so ridiculous at your seat so that people feel you have been overcome and overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. You can make sure that you use big words so people think you're smart. Some of y'all are like, yeah, that's you, Taylor. And you know what? Maybe it is. I need to repent of that. But what about you? Or you can seek praise from men by not using many words because people know that's what Jesus told you to do. And they praise you for that as well. Humility comes when it comes to prayer. When it comes to prayer, humility has nothing to do with what other people think. It has everything to do with the fellowship with God and honoring him as an audience of one. Have you ever noticed that the loudest people who talk about their spirituality and their faith are exactly the people who need the most attention and praise from man? Any toes in pain yet? Very often the most outwardly spiritual and mature Christians who seek to demonstrate this reality are the ones who are the most shallow. Jesus warns them, don't be like the hypocrites. We're all sickened by people that we perceive to be spiritually hypocritical and doing everything they do for the praise and adoration of man. How much more do you think the God-man who came in the flesh to forgive us of our sins and with all sincerity at all times prayed to his Father is sickened by the hypocrisy seen in most Christians and churches? How do you think it makes him feel? They love to pray standing. I love this. I laughed. They love to pray standing. Think of why he said this. He did not have to leave this detail in. He could have excluded this, but he added it on purpose. He made a point to use the word standing. What does standing indicate about someone in the context of prayer? These are just some thoughts. Standing in the public assembly, right? That's what this is talking about. Number one, that they can't stay long. That it's a drive-by prayer. Sorry, it's just my upbringing. Uh, number two, that they potentially have a posture of power rather than humility. When people stand, it's powerful rather than sitting. Sitting is not as intimidating. And number three, that they want to be visible. You're a lot easier to see when you're standing up. What does praying out loud in this context tell you about people and what they believe about prayer? Number one, sometimes that prayer was for show. Number two, that prayer was for others. And number three, that prayer was for themselves, potentially. What good comes from people who pray so that they can be seen by others? Can other people answer their prayers? Do other people have the ability to bless them? Does someone become justified on the basis of what other people think about them and their righteousness? Of course not. Preposterous. Question. This is a question for you to answer. Seriously, about yourself. Don't say, oh, doll off. No, 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 you. When you pray, do you look down on yourself or do you look down on others? Is prayer a method to make yourself look great? Or to exalt God. C.S. Lewis famously said. Anybody know who C.S. Lewis is in here? Okay. Anybody read any of his books? Okay. Anybody read any of his books that are not the Chronicles of Narnia? You don't care. What was it, though? I don't know. It was first for me to Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, all hail. Go ahead. Um, uh, 
Ah, so let me, yes sir. And also, it was like, the one went to the wardrobe and that yeah. one that had a painting that teleported them. Yeah, yeah. The, you seen the movies? The one that, yes, yeah, the movies. Yeah, so let me let me commend C.S. Lewis's work to you. That's a very basic white girl thing to say. It's a very, you know, religious major at DBU, ETBU, OBU place type thing to say. But, but listen, but listen, okay? I, I absolutely commend his writings to you. It, most uh, Mere Christianity, we should do a study on that sometime. Fantastic book. But listen, he said this quote, It's hard to see something above you when you're always looking down at other people. It's hard to see God above you when you're so worried about looking down your nose at other people. Let's make sure that when we bow our heads, we also, again, bow our hearts. Because a humble head with an arrogant heart will receive no grace from God. A humble head with a proud or arrogant heart will receive no grace from God. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what posture you take. What matters, just like everything else in Matthew 5, is the heart. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. This, this verse is tender, and it took me a long time to see it. But it's a sweet verse. Who is unseen? Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The Bible does not forbid praying out loud or in public. I want to be clear about that. Those are and were a big part of God's people, and they're a big part of what we do now. The issue outlined in verse 6 is the nature of how we pray. Prayer, maybe more than any other spiritual discipline, is the most prone to being done for because of an outward glory and fame of the person doing it. In other words, prayer, more than anything else you do, is most likely to be abused for the sake of your own praise. Not scripture reading. Preaching is up there, definitely. Not sharing the gospel. Not singing. Prayer, because it's so personal and it's so private, is very likely to be corrupted by your heart faster than anything else. Think about it. What other discipline that is done is less able to be verified and criticized? Now, that's a valuable question. Avery, if you get up and read the Bible, I can go. That ain't what it says. I have it right here. You're tripping. Evelyn, if you get up and share the gospel, and it's not the gospel, it's the gospel of Burger King, and you, all you say over and over is have it your way. Right? I can verify that that's not biblical. Uh, Dalen. If you get up and you start singing a song that's not biblical, I can say that's a violation of Scripture. Alex, you know, if you get up and you start sharing your testimony, well, that's a little harder to criticize because it's your story, right? But, but I can also say, well, what happened to you, like we had that talk that day, what happened to you is not in line with what happens when someone says the gospel, or it is, right? I can, I can verify everything I just said. But when you're praying to yourself, like most of us do, and we don't pray out loud, how do I how do I validate that? How do I invalidate that? It's just what you claim happens in your own personal life. And for most people, it's not really happening at all. They say it is, but it's not. So how, how do I... And, and, and when you're alone and you're praying, supposedly, what about when... And then you say, well, God spoke to me when we were praying. How do I know that? I prayed and he spoke back. How, I, how do I invalidate that? You see what I'm saying? How do I validate it? Let's say I'm, I'm trying to validate what you How do I even do that? Other than, well, you just quoted John 3.16 back to me. So, yeah, I mean, he told all of us that. But, okay. Sure, great. I mean... It's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat without a hat. It doesn't make any sense. How do I invalidate something that happens just between you and God? Now, also, how do I believe it? Why should I believe you? 
It's not as credible as reading the word or sharing a testimony or singing a song that's gospel based or or reading scriptures like Avery or Evelyn, you know, sharing the gospel like those are all things I can validate. Are you impressed? I remembered all the order in reverse. All right. So. Prayer is the thing we deem so private and so personal that we remove it from the public domain and we don't know what anyone else is praying what they're actually saying, or if they're praying at all. In some sense, we are so private with prayer that we are the opposite of the Pharisees. They were so public with it. And we're focused and fixated on not doing it. We avoid it at all costs. Nonetheless, when it comes to prayer, we ought to be the most cautious because it reveals our heart more than many other things. How many of you guys can say that your prayers are deeply personal? They're deeply, like... Emotional, maybe sometimes they're deeply, and that's a good thing, by the way. They ought to be. They're they're deeply like I don't want to share those. So so when you share prayer requests, it may be easier, right? We were talking about this earlier. It may be easier to share a prayer request than to pray in front of people, right? Because you're you're sharing something that you want someone else to pray about, but it's really scary to pray in front of other people, especially people you don't trust, right? And people you don't know. Correct? Am I? Am I right or wrong? In fact, I looked at a statistic this week. It said only 2% of people feel comfortable praying in front of others. Two. I guess that's why we've got three people in our small group that we just rotate with, right? So 2% of people, and by the way, 2% of people, same number, those same freaks like me, feel comfortable praying in front of the whole church, right? But most people don't. That would, that would make you pee down your leg, most of y'all, Right? If on a Sunday morning somebody called you up in front of the church and asked you to pray on the spot. Yes or no? Landon's like, no, I got it. I could do it. That's the look on your face. Is that what you're thinking or no? Good answer. It's like class all over again. Um, So, it has been said that we assume of all, now listen to me. This, This took me a little bit, okay? It has been said that we assume that of all places, prayer is the place we're safe from the devil. That's not true. Now some of y'all go, ah, this is about to get weird, I think. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that as Jesus was fasting in the wilderness, Satan appeared to him to tempt him. That's number one. And number two... If the devil can't keep you from praying, he can certainly try and get your prayers discarded by your own pride and hypocrisy. God doesn't want anything to do with your prayers that are full of pride, egotism, and hypocrisy. Not interesting. Why would he be? If Satan was in heaven asking to afflict an injured Job, what makes you think that he can't be in your ear tempting you To puff yourself up with hollow and empty words when you pray. If he was in heaven, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. This is after the fall. It's after his fall. It's after Adam and Eve's fall. Thousands of years later. Probably 2,000 years later. Job is on earth and Satan appears in heaven in a line with holy angels. And God says, where have you been? And he says, roaming to and fro, the good old King James. Roaming to and fro upon the earth. My point is, heaven is not even clean. That's why the new heavens and the new earth are new. Because he throws all of creation away and recreates everything. I don't know that you've ever thought about that. There's a high likelihood you've never actually thought about that. That Satan, after the fall, was present, according to Job, in heaven. He definitely can be in your room when you're kneeling down, praying, now I lay me down to sleep. What? It's a little off topic. Um, Great. So where... where... What in the Bible like kind of um, is an inference that God and Satan's debate was in heaven? Because I, I thought it was like a. Well, I, I think I got what you're saying. So. Go back to the beginning of it. I don't have time to flip to it, but go read it. So it, it says that. Read it carefully, but the holy angels are presenting them before the throne of God, presenting themselves. Mm-hmm. So. That's that's a concept. We may have to talk about this after, Alex. It's a good question. So, Jesus' point is that the best prayers are those that are unseen by others to a God that you can't see. 
You ever, have you ever, you ever seen God? Anybody in here ever seen him with your own two eyes? No? I mean, Old Testament, no one can see my face and live, correct? So no one's seen God. Now, no, the guys in the New Testament, wandering the streets of Israel and Jerusalem, they walked with God in the flesh every day, right? Veiled by human flesh, but still truly God, truly God, truly man, vera homo vera deus, truly man, truly God, right? But you haven't. And a vision doesn't count, by the way, or a dream, or an acid trip. Where is Dan? Speaking of, okay. Uh, so, uh, as for you, brother, I hope you're listening. So, um, is it true? It, uh, it is true that you can judge the measure of a man or woman by how much they spend time in a room alone with God. This idea is to get as far away from others as possible so you are not tempted with pride and arrogance that lurks in the human heart. It is also true in a sense that we are always before the face of God and that we must be willing to acknowledge that we are always praying, technically, because God knows our thoughts and searches our hearts. You're always praying. The question is whether you're doing it intentionally or not. I mean, right now you're thinking and he's reading your mind like a teleprompter. You can't, you ever thought about that? You can't hide a single thought from him. You can't hide a single emotion from him. The question is, are you doing it intentionally? Get alone with God, is Jesus' point, and pour out your heart to him. I heard somebody point out something. I said it at small group last night. I heard somebody point out something that was interesting. It was Paul Washer. He said, "When you, it says Jesus would frequently in the four Gospels that he would slip away to pray. And his point that I would have never been smart enough to make on my own is that you only slip away to do something that you really, really love. You avoid other things to slip away and do something. Like, I slip away to go to sleep. Or, obviously, I slip away to eat. And that's obvious. So, I slip away to do things that I find pleasure in. Jesus would slip away, sometimes days at a time, and pray to his Father by himself. because Not because he needed something from him, but because he enjoyed fellowship with him. Because he loved him more than life itself. What about us? You should never be more honest with anyone than you are with God. If you have a friend, listen to me, if you have a friend that you're more honest with than you are with the Lord... It's not so much that your friend is the problem, it's that your view of your friendship with the Lord is the problem. What, do you, what are you hiding anyway? What, what, what can you actually hide from him? Well, you can't. Yeah, you can't. There's a few things to get rid of in our prayers. I wrote a list down. Um, stay calm, everyone. Number one, a few things to get rid of in our prayers. Number one, the need to tell God anything as if he doesn't know. Lord, help me. I am so tired, sick and tired of hearing people pray. All of this, well, Lord, I just want to tell you about this. I know I don't, I don't. know you're busy, and I know you haven't heard this, but things are not going so well with me and Richard and our relationship. Like, it, seriously, why, why in the name of Sam Hill would you speak that way to an omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omnipotent God? The sovereign ruler of the universe. What are you? Who are you to inform him of anything? It's rhetorical. Who are you? I could use somebody to tell him something he don't know. I'm assuming that's a no. Thank you. Thank you. She was speechless because she was just filled with humility. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Uh, number two. Don't think that you are doing God a favor by praying to him. Molly, good to see you. Don't think. Did you die here? Looks great. Don't think that you're doing God a favor by praying to him. You're not. 
and there's other stuff i'm just leaving it out so you can actually write you're welcome number three stop saying just all the time in your prayers good lord have mercy you go what does that mean well lord we just bring brother bob before you we just bring our house and our mortgage before you lord we just bring brother sue or brother so-and-so's cancer <laughs> We just, just, just stop talking like that as if it's an inconvenience to him. He wants to hear from you. Well, it's just me again. And if you can find just a little bit of grace in your heart, then you can just be a little bit more kind to me and just need your help on this. Stop. Stop talking like that. That's ridiculous. Number four, stop talking as if he has limited power. Well, if you can make it work, then I just... Here we go again. He's omnipotent. Stop talking like he has limited power. You have limited power, but he does not. Now, I don't know... I want to quote the emperor here from Star Wars. Unlimited power. Right? Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. Here, here's my thing. Okay? Here's, here's what I want to make sure you hear. Power is not in any person you've ever seen. It's derived. Listen to me. All the strength that's in your body right now, it's derived from him. Every strength of every spider crawling outside on a tree or on the ground or grasshopper jumping or bird flying in the air is strength that comes from him. If he ceased to exist, everything in the universe would implode and every creature would drop dead instantly. Yes, sir. Simply saying, Lord, I am hurting, he will take it as. Every single thing that you're hurting from is what you just prayed for. Even if you just said, Lord, I am hurting, right? You're yeah, right. you don't have to be a bunch of words. Yeah, if right. you do not want that bad thing. Right, correct. Okay, number five, stop praying half-hearted prayers. If they're half-hearted, just save it. Number six, stop praying primarily to receive, but to give praise. You'll see, you'll see the way Jesus next week opens up the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He starts out that prayer. And he tells us, by the way, to start out every prayer. That's a model for every other prayer. He's telling us to start our prayers always with praise. But we start, well, it's just me again, Lord. We, we do that. And we just, it's ridiculous. Number seven, stop feeling as if prayer is something you're forced to do. It's a privilege. Number eight, stop viewing prayer as a way to change God's mind. The moment you change God's mind, please tell me your secret. Because if you change God's mind, it must necessitate that you know better than him. And we are apparently, you've been trying to tell people your whole life how great you are, and we've just not listened. But if you can change God's mind, then we ought to erect an altar to you too and worship you. Because you know better than him. Blasphemy. Number nine, don't let your mind wander. Don't let your mind wander. Don't get distracted. If you're not focused on what you're saying, just say amen and move on. Don't sit there and babble. Number ten, don't say what your heart feels or what you want it to feel. Words are just a way to communicate your heart. I think what I meant was do say what your heart feels or what you want it to feel. So you can cross out the NT from don't. Make it do. A big God means that no prayer goes unanswered. Now listen to this. The big question is, is my will in line with his will? He and we, rather, we must be willing to admit that God will work all things according to his good pleasure, according to Ephesians 1.11. Evelyn, Ephesians 1.11.
Is it comforting to know that God sees all, knows all, and will answer all of your prayers perfectly in accordance with his will, either through providence or through miracles? Pretty amazing. No prayer goes unanswered. Verse 7, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. I love this part. This is my jam. But they think it will be heard because of the many words. One of the biggest issues that all pagan religions involve themselves in is that they pray big and long prayers that are based on many words. Words do not impress God. Now, now I wrote this down. I thought it was rather clever. Words do not impress God. Have you ever considered that he wrote a book and then stopped giving inerrant revelation? He hasn't written anything down in almost 2,000 years. Your words don't impress him. He wrote his book, his perfect book, and then he stopped writing. But your Shakespearean oratory is going to impress and knock the socks off of him. Ridiculous. God doesn't need your words. We pray silent prayers all the time, and that's good too. He doesn't need your words, and he doesn't need your repetition. One heartfelt word, one heartfelt word of adoration or desperation from a born-again child of God is better than a million heartless words from some stranger outside the kingdom of God. The word babbling should be seen as a callback to the Tower of Babel, where God confused and mixed up our languages. When someone babbles, they talk utter nonsense. They speak in a way that is worthless and annoying. Think about this verse. When we speak nonsense because we repeat ourselves over and over, we do it for a few reasons. Number one, we think we look more spiritual by talking longer. Number two, we think God hears us if we say it more. Number three, y'all good over there? We think we can impress God if we talk a lot. Think of how Muslims have an organized prayer schedule. At least five times a day they pray. They're serious about their many words. Their God does not hear them because he is not real. And by the way, the Catholic rosary, rubbing on beads, praying these Hail Marys over and over and over and over again, worthless. Absolutely worthless. Pagans say so many words because they know none of them get through. Is that why you talk so much? Because you don't think they're getting through? How often do you pray without faith a prayer that you repeat with a half-passionate plea because you think he doesn't hear you anyway? God hears all, sees all, knows all. There's no such thing as something getting past God. And you can come boldly before him because of what Christ has accomplished. And now you are in Christ. Now, I'm, I'm not, I don't have time to read this because we're going to break out here in a second. But I encourage you to go read Isaiah 44. Write that in your notes. When you get home, this will be your homework. Isaiah 44. And the whole chapter is great. But verses 7 through 11 would be good. Verses 7 through 11 would be good. Ivy, you would know, right? No. I S I A H. Wait, what is it? I S A I A H. Yeah, you spoke it wrong. Okay. Ready? Last two pages. He says, he makes fun of, this is the context of that passage. You go read it. God makes fun of idols. He makes fun of a guy, actually, who takes a log and cuts it into pieces and starts a fire and cooks his meat and then worships an idol crafted from that log. And the point is, every god except him doesn't exist. God mocks the idols and bring them, brings them to shame and humiliates them. How much more ought we to pray to a god that is not only real but also who listens? The god who listens is who you worship. If pagans can pray to a god they know isn't real and scream to the abyss, Begging someone to answer who cannot answer, how much more sincere should we be? It would be a good idea to stop listening. Listen, it would be a good idea to stop praying. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It would also be a good idea to stop praying this prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. 
If our heart is not engaged, what makes you think our mind is either? Last verse. Don't be like them, for your Father knows that you need what you need before you ask Him. Jesus' correction ends right back where you would expect it to, the sovereign goodness of God. Jesus says, don't be forceful and repetitive because God knows what we need already. We are not forcing Him and we are not informing Him. There is a sense in which repetitive and forceful asking is repetitive iteration demonstrating a lack of faith. Keep asking and pleading with God, yes, but a heart filled with gratitude that is soaked in the goodness of God so that when prayer rings out of your soul, it is thankfulness that drips from your heart. Have you ever thought or prayed that God would do something that you could convince him of that he does not want to do? Have you ever thought that you would be that you would be more kind or more loving or more gracious, more understanding in your prayer regarding something than you care about than him? How absurd. It changed my prayers personally entirely the night praying with my son as I do every night. That I realized while praying for his speech and that God would grant him the ability to speak. That it's blasphemy for me to assume that I love my son more than God does. I am not appealing to him to be something he isn't. I'm just appealing to him to be all that he has manifested and materialized in my life in ways that I can see and understand. This evening, we're done. Just listen. This evening, what is it that you need to change about your prayer life? What do you need to change in the way that you relate to God? Before we go to small groups, take a second. Just a minute or so. Take a second to pray and please Start with praise to God and ask Him to give you wisdom in regards to how you relate to Him. Ask Him to show you who He really is from His Word and then that you would believe it. Turn the camera off.